This is the lecture on the nature of work in the U.S. today and tomorrow. On behalf of the Richmond Center, a joint venture of Columbia Law School and Columbia Business School, thank you for joining us. I am uh, Jesse Green, senior fellow at the Richmond Center. Uh, the Richmond Center promotes evidence-based public policy and fosters dialogue and debate on emerging policy questions where business and markets intersect with the law. Certainly today's topic involves business, markets, and the law in complex and important ways. The to topic of the day is an important one to all Americans and especially our students here at Columbia. Today we see the U.S. economy improving, yet unemployment, the unemployment rate me remains high. Major U.S. corporations are not hiring as we had expected. Something has changed. What is the new paradigm? To help us understand this better, we have two experts on labor markets and the factors that drive them. We have with us Carl Camden, President and CEO of Kelly Services, and Andrew Stern, Ronald Lowe Perlman, Senior Fellow at the Richmond Center. Kelly Services is a leader in workforce management services and human resources solutions. Carl has held the CEO role since 2006. He is a thought leader on talent management and a frequent speaker at international conferences on human resource strategies, leadership, and changing labor dynamics. He holds an undergraduate degree from Southwest Baptist College, a graduate degree in clinical psychology and speech communications from Central Missouri State University, and a doctorate in communications from Ohio State University. Andrew Stern is the former president of Services Employees International Union and a leading voice on major issues confronting American workers and the American economy. He is the author of A Country That Works, his 20th first century views, ideas, and views, and practical solutions about restoring the American dream. He was presi a presidential appoint appointee to the Simpson-Bowles Commission and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on U.S. Trade and Investment Policy. He is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and a frequent contributor to the Richmond Center lectures and other key events here at Columbia. Thanks to both of you for your participation tonight, and we'd like to get started. Carl, would you like to kick us off here with uh, your views of what's going on in this market? Thank you all for having me here. I joined Kelly in 1995, and when I joined Kelly, we won what was then the largest contract in the staffing industry. It was an aggregation of temporary staffing for Johnson & Johnson, a small pharmaceutical company and they were spending $50 million on the temporary staffing, they thought, in the United States. <clears throat> it was a big contract and unusual for the industry. Three years ago, we signed a contract with British Petroleum to aggregate all of their free agent spend, which I'll talk about in a second. That would include things like temporary employees, independent contractors, consultants, self-employed professionals, and the spend that BP thought they had was $1 billion a year in, in this spend. Last month, we renewed the contract with BP for another three years. We've got up to about $550 million that we had managed to migrate into our program, but now we know that they're spending a little over $2 billion a year in free agent spend. And there's probably yet more to be discovered. Unless you think that BP is an aberration, we have signed billion dollar plus management contracts with Johnson & Johnson, Rio Tinto, and Dow. In fact, one of the first things I think you need to understand about what I view as the new world of work is that for major global corporations, they all use more labor working on their behalf than they have being directly employed by them. In fact, for the major global corporations, labor working on their behalf is about 60% of the total labor they deploy. So on any given day, as people cross, and since we run BP's ID management program, we know, uh, that every given day as people cross the threshold of BP facilities, 60% of those people aren't BP employees. Okay, they are free agents of a variety of types. Their employment status differ from country to country, but they are managed by Kelly Services and deployed on behalf of BP around the world. 
In fact, in the United States, as we do our studies, we would argue that over 40% of the U.S. workforce that goes to work every day goes to work as a free agent rather than as a permanent employee, or as my free agents would prefer to call them, wage slaves. Just to give you a perception on the difference that's emerging uh, between, the, between the two workforces. So we'll talk in a little bit about why the free agent workforce is emerging. There's dynamics both from the worker perspective as well as dynamics from the customer perspective, but it creates a very powerful shift in the idea of how people work, and increasingly people choose to work as a free agent or in charge of their own employment relationship. Secondly, what we need to understand in terms of the world of work is that job life cycles are, are shrinking at an incredible rate. If I define a job as a job life cycle, is how long can you expect a job once started to exist in its current form, and by form we mean in that location for that employer uh, doing basically the same type of task? What do we think the average life cycle is in the United States? Any guesses? Yes. <laughs> Usually people say seven, ten. No, so three years, three, three and a half years actually is the amount of time that a, an average job life, you know, job life is going to persist. Which is interesting because if you ask the new generation of workers coming into the workforce, how long do they plan to stay with their current employer? The answer is three years. And if you ask company management, how long do you think you can commit? to keep an employee engaged and trained sufficient to do their job? The answer is about three to four years. So we have a consensus emerging that says a job and a job relationship can last about three years uh, inside the United States, it's slightly longer in Europe, a little bit slightly longer yet in Asia, but around the world job life cycles are continuing to shrink. So we have a world of work where an increasing number of people don't engage in a traditional employment relationship and we have a world of work where a job doesn't persist. How many of you grew up with your parents saying something like, we want you to be able to get a good job? How many of you had that conversation with your parents? Okay. What was a good job? I can tell you what my parents thought was a good job, but in your world, what was a good job? Come on, don't be shy, you guys are not supposed to be shy. We didn't have to ask them for money. What? Where we wouldn't have to ask them for money. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a father of two excellent things. <laughs> Go ahead. I think definitely a perception that a good job is one you would keep for like 30 years, right. you would tend to get a pension. And you would be taken, you could have a job for life, pretty much, and you would be taken care of not only through the job, but after the job it would end up with a pension. What are the other aspects of a good job? Good benefits. Okay. Good benefits, right? So the primary definition in the U.S. of a good job was a job that offered benefits, a job that you could work at forever, and in Europe they would add on a notion of a job that would be respected. You know, and, and some of that in the U.S. too, that you wanted a job that people would, you know, would like. So today I will tell you there are no good jobs by your parents' definition. There is an abundance of good work to be done in this country. There is an abundance of good opportunity for us, but the social contract as defined in the post-World War II era is silly in the context of today's economy. And one of the things that Andy and I work on together and talk about is what's a form of a new social contract that ultimately is going to have to be created uh, to, to deal with this new world of work. So let's come back now and talk about this free agent workforce in the United States that represents 40 some percent of the people who go to work every day in the U.S. Who are they? So if you were guessing what their age was, what would be the typical age of, a, of the free agent workforce in the U.S.? What? 18. 18. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, so the perception in the United States of the free agent worker on one side is that they're young workers. And in fact, for those of you who are stat freaks, there's a, you know, you, you've got a statistical relationship where you get one of these really cool, you know, binomial type of distributions where we've got a large group under the age of 30, which is what you all are talking about, but the largest group of free agent workers in the United States are over the age of 55. So I describe them as two groups. The over 55 group has been there, got the t-shirt. Okay, not going to do that again. That's my over 55s who have left the permanent workforce. The children have left home. And in fact, the greatest predictor of people who are going to work in a in the more traditional employment mode is do they have children living at home? Which I'm going to get to in a second and ask you why that is here in the United States. But a very large group. And then in the under 30 group, which is where the wage slave phrasing came from and their blogs and so on, I view them as the young invincibles. And they've got the perspective, like perhaps many of you all do, that of course you can control your own destiny. Why would you let other people control your means of production? Why would you let others benefit from you know, your intellectual capital? You will own that on your own, and you will achieve it and start your own company. In fact, as I look at business schools, the percentage of graduates out of the business school who are refusing to go interview at the big companies is increasing. And in fact, you, I see many of the new MBAs talking about how do we work for a smaller enterprise, how do we start our own company, how do I come up with my own idea uh, that I can put forward. So you have a free agent identity arising in the U.S. that is bifurcated on age. You've got, a very, you've got an older group, you've got a younger group. Now that's group in the middle. You have a child, you know, you have a ch child rearing group where all of a sudden the participation rate in the free agent workforce drops dramatically. Why is that? I'm sorry, somebody's up over here? Yeah, the benefit structure in the U.S. is <coughs> for the free agent workforce. Okay. And in particular, what does U.S. law not well represent for the free agents in terms of benefit structure? What's the most difficult benefit for a free agent to get? Yeah, health insurance. Because in the in the whole world, two countries have chosen to deliver benefit via employer. The United States and Turkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're leading that. <laughs> There's a reason that countries have chosen to tie it either to employment or citizenship, and the reason is, is that, in fact, it creates a job-locking situation, and when we had the newly emergent social contract, a byproduct of the wage price controls was health insurance, and a byproduct of that to the benefit of the social contract was that it locked people into a relationship with the employer. So we can talk about how it was all paternalistic. You know, the company takes care of me, I take care of the company. In my more cynical view, it was the companies finally figured out that they had locked in the employee set. Uh, with the way health insurance was, and that people who wanted to pursue other forms of work would find it difficult to do so. So one of the reasons that the under 30s participate so well is they don't believe they're going to get sick anyway. <laughs> so it's okay. And then the over 55s have retired, and the current generation carry with them insurance often from the, re you know, the retirees, and the other group are, you know, I, I see kicking out as Medicare and so on kicks out. So we have, an inc we have a increasing population working in a free agent mode, choosing to, uh, choosing on the side of the meme of, you know, I'm going to control my own destiny, I'm going to be my own worker. For my sound and video crew, are you an independent contractor? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is life good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Is life better than the suits? <laughs> that I have discovered with Tony Andy is I give these presentations, there's an invisible screen of independent contractors that are, that are all around us that we often don't notice, don't acknowledge, and so on, but they enable meetings like this, they enable, in fact, our society to work, and I've rarely met one who says, life is really yucky bad, man, I have to tell you, this isn't good. And in fact, our own surveys of employee satisfaction, employee engagement that we do, 
uh, show that the, the average score of a free agent worker in terms of their satisfaction with their work and their work-life balance in particular is far greater than the traditional workforce. And for those of you who are really interested in getting into the demography or the psychographics of the free agent workforce, a little plug for Kelly, download the Talent app, the Talent Project app, and we post all of our research and, uh, you know, and so on there. And I think it's would be interesting to read as we see the, you know, the new world taking, new world taking shape. So we have to admit that in the U.S. in particular, we have a social policy issue where we have a fair number of people locked into the free agent mode, in, locked into a permanent employee motif who would prefer to be free agents. Now up to this point, I've been telling you all the good stuff. Life is good. Okay. Let's also very quickly, before I turn the floor over to Andy, who will further trash me, let's talk, about, <laughs> let's talk about some of the bad stuff. I talk about the lawyers, the scientists, the engineers who work for Kelly as free agents. I talk about the people making fifty, a hundred, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year as Kelly free agents. Life is excellent for them. Let's also acknowledge that a big portion of the free agent workforce are those unable to find permanent employment because they have lower skills, because companies are choosing to staff minimum wage jobs with temporary employees, deliberately avoiding social obligations. Look at the blitz of letters that went out following the Affordable Care Act, teaching companies who employ those workers how to dodge their social obligations so that they weren't going to pick up those benefit costs. And for every worker that I get to talk about who's a PhD scientist, and Kelly's one of the largest employers of PhDs in the world as free agent workers, I acknowledge there are probably one to two minimum wage workers who are being abused by the free agent concept and without sufficient protections by our government or its social policies in terms of the extension of benefits. So we have, your generation has a lot of work to do at crafting how social policy is going to be carried out in a world in which the traditional relationship between work, job, and employer has been irrevocably broken. Secondly, we created a world and an education system that taught people that their career was going to be managed by who? By their employer. If their skills went out of date, who was going to take care of it? Right? If they got sick, who was going to take care of it? Their employer. Right, guys, I won't keep on doing more questions, so it's kind of fun to do. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the answer was the employer. Right? But that was to work for Columbia still. <laughs> The employees, not right. the students in the audience, don't believe that. Oh, you're so 20th century. <laughs> With my Russian friends, that's the greatest insult you get to give. They actually have way cool role in your eyes. You're so 20th century. <laughs> um, and one of my best, one of my greatest employees is a Russian who got her MBA here from Columbia. She uh, ran our Russian operations, ran our largest account in the U.S. I just shipped her over to China to be the chief operating officer of our joint venture there. She's a superstar. See what a Columbia MBA does for you. <laughs> no, but she's, she's doing great and you know, a great sense of college. But we need to recognize that we have gone through a, a 80 year period, no, probably about 80, say 70 year period, where the dominant meme and the dominant social rules was that your company was going to be responsible for your career. So today, if you start having career difficulty and you go to the HR department and you say, gee, I'm worried that my factory is going to be closed or this operation is going to be outsourced, what do you want me to do next? HR is going to say, I don't know, get your resume out on the street, with you, right? <laughs> but they don't view themselves as responsible. So how many of you, as you've been going through your education all the way up through your undergrad degree and now your Columbia MBA, have been taught how you manage your career in a free agent world? You've all been raised to believe the employer was going to do it, it ain't going to happen. And our education system has, in this generation has a break point, which is we haven't taught people how to thrive in the world, that we are unfolding upon them. And the break points that I see in terms of social policy are great. I've uh, talked probably long enough to be provocative, and now I will Andy give you all the answers as how it's all going to be fixed. <laughs> First of all, let's say thank you to Carl. <laughs> So 
uh, what Carl hasn't said is that uh, he was one of the earliest uh, business supporters of uh, what is now, I guess, appropriately called Obamacare. Uh, he and I are in the process of writing an op-ed about why we need to raise the minimum wage dramatically, not incrementally. Um, and a lot of that has to go with what I hope to talk about here, uh, which is sort of wrapping around Carl kind of a larger context and then even a bigger challenge, I think, we now face in terms of not just the free agent economy, but where are there going to be jobs as we go forward in the future? Now, this <coughs> So life when I grew up was really simple. When you learned about the economy, you got one job. And all you had to understand about economics was like a train. The engine of the train was growth. The fuel of the train was productivity. And it pulled along wages. And it pulled along jobs with it. And so in my generation, when people talked about growth, they automatically meant of course, that meant more jobs and more wages. And then in the 1980s, something began to happen, which we didn't recognize for a while. And that was all of a sudden, the wage part of the train got decoupled. So all of a sudden, we were seeing productivity growth, we were seeing wage growth, I can turn this on, sorry. We were seeing productivity growth. We were seeing job growth, we were seeing GDP growth, but all of a sudden we weren't seeing wage growth. And so when people now still talk about growth, they talk about it as if they're all integrated. But in the 1980s and clearly by the year 2000, we all began to realize something very not positive was going on. And then in the 20th century, being in the 21st century, we decoupled jobs. So now we have GDP growth, we have productivity growth, but jobs and wages have been decoupled from both of them. And so all of a sudden we realized in the 21st century, in the first decade of the 21st century, we created not one new net job. That's before the great economic collapse, that's after the great economic collapse, America created not one new net job. Productivity was growing, wages weren't. Productivity was growing, jobs weren't. And all of a sudden, as a result of all of that, labor share of the economy was shrinking. That meant for every dollar produced in growth, the amount that went to labor was shrinking. And as no surprise, the amount that was going to corporations and capital was growing. Not necessarily anything insidious, just a natural way as we began to decouple and globalization came to play that we began to see this change. As a result of corporate profits growing, uh, we saw that most of the gains then went to the owners of capital, the investors in capital, the executives of capital, and that's what we've seen, is, which is this growing inequality. So we all know that story. It's a harsh reality. If you want to get kind of the exclamation point of all of it, in 2011, we returned to the same GDP level we had pre-recession but there were seven million less people producing the same GDP in relatively three years of time as business and others retooled to deal with the economic collapse. Now, there's a lot of debate, and we're not going to do it here, about what caused it. People can mix and match on this list. It's really not important. What's important to understand is we are at a moment where this is not a cyclical change. This is not a momentary change. It is not a result of a bubble. It is not a result of a recession. It is the nature of the way that our economy will work going forward. Michael Spence, an econ Nobel Prize economist, talks about how we've replaced manual jobs by machines, and now we're moving on to replacing white collar jobs by machines. What I like to say is we need to appreciate this is a revolutionary moment. This is an economic revolutionary moment. It is not cyclical. In fact, it's only the third economic revolutionary moment in the history of the world. This is the global technological revolution. And where the agricultural revolution took 3,000 years to make a transition, and the industrial revolution took 300 years to make a transition, this is a 30-year transition in this global revolution. 
No single generation of people have ever gone through this much change in a single lifetime. And at revolutionary moments, what it really means is the past is no longer an accurate guide to the future. So everybody keeps saying, well, this recession is acting differently than previous recessions, or the business cycle doesn't seem to be working, or the market doesn't seem to be working. It's not. This is a revolutionary moment, and we need to be like Cortez. If we are going to build economy that we want to work, we have to burn the ships of the 20th century economy and realize we are never going back to that economy again, as Carl talked about, the one job in a lifetime, employer-dominated economy. The question is, how do we go forward and build a 21st century economy? So all the discussions in Washington, as far as I'm concerned, or on Wall Street, or in, in business schools like Columbia, where we talk about if we could only end uncertainty, if we only could get regulation out of the way, if we could only have more innovation or education or taxation changes, we could answer all America's long-term economic problems, that discussion is equally as misplaced as well. So the last thing I want to say before I just show you something is there's actually going to be two parts to this third economic revolution. The first part of this third economic revolution was the globalization and the interconnectedness of the economy. We sort of set the stage in the first part of this third economic revolution. The second part of this economic revolution is far more significant than what we face today. So according to an old legend, the inventor of the game of chess takes it to the emperor of India and shows it to him. And the emperor is so delighted by this elegant game that he says, you can name your own reward. And the inventor, being a clever guy, says, your majesty, I'm a humble person. All I want is a pile of rice. And we're going to determine the size of the pile of rice by putting one grain of rice on the first square of my chessboard, doubling that, putting two on the second, doubling it, putting four on the third, so on, up through 64 squares. And the emperor thinks the guy actually is being humble, so he kind of grants the request really easily. Now, those of us who have had enough math know what happens. O those doublings over time accumulate to the point that after 64 squares on the chessboard, you've got a pile of rice the size of Mount Everest. It's more rice than has ever been produced in the history of the world. And in some versions of the legend, the emperor cuts off the guy's head when he realizes he's been had. Now, where I think this gets interesting and relevant for understanding what's going on with technology and the economy is at that point when the emperor says, oh, wow, this is not what I expected at all, because Ray Kurzweil, who's a great inventor and futurist, makes the point that that realization happens right about at the, in the midpoint of the chessboard. So after 32 squares, you've got 4 billion grains of rice, which is a lot, but it's about what you'd get from one field. It's not going to bankrupt the emperor. It's not going to cause the inventor to lose his head. It's only in the second half of the chessboard, after you've had enough of those cumulative doublings, that we start to get piles of rice the size of Mount Everest, and we start to find that all of our in experience and our intuition is no longer a good guide. So maybe the emperor, emperor's intuition was, I'm going to give this guy a field's worth of rice. That would be a, a legitimate reward. He wound up having to give him a Mount Everett wor worth of rice. That's the difference between the first half of the chessboard and the second half of the chessboard. The reason we bring this up in our book is because of Moore's Law, which is the constant doubling of computer power. So very much like the, the piles of rice keep doubling, computer power keeps doubling. And we did a, a simple calculation, and we found out that if you take Moore's Law into account and you start counting at about the time that companies started buying computers, we entered the second half of the chessboard in about 2006. Now, that's not a precise calculation, but it really helps me understand why a lot of these weird examples of science fiction becoming reality and these astonishing digital innovations that we're seeing seem to be mounting up in recent years. I don't think that's just an impression. I think that's reality, and it's because we are now in the second half of the chessboard of computing power. If that's at all accurate, what it means is, honestly, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, now, I'd like you to describe another instance, which is the Google car. Yep. Because it fits, as you've told us in the seminar, it fits perfectly in that time scheme. 
So I think this is a great example of the first half of the chessboard versus the second half of the chessboard because there was a really well done book written in 2004 by a couple of our colleagues at MIT who took the, a very careful look at what computers were good at versus what people were good at. And they tried to delineate those two. And as exhibit A of what people were inherently quite good at and computers were lousy at and going to continue to be lousy at, they gave driving a car in traffic, which is this terribly difficult sensory challenge, information processing challenge, pattern matching challenge. We're pretty good at it. And they said computers are hopelessly bad. Now, in 2004, DARPA, the research arm of the Defense Department, put out a challenge about self-driving cars. And if you look at the very first um, instances of self-driving cars, it seemed to support that book because they were terrible. They, they rear-ended each other, they drove into walls, they, they couldn't figure anything out. So it looked like that was a pretty accurate characterization of people versus computers. You fast forward to 2010, Google announces that it has built an autonomous car that has driven thousands of miles on American roads in traffic with no accidents. By now here in 2012, those cars have logged, I think it's hundreds of thousands of miles, again with an almost impeccable driving record. And this is an example of science fiction becoming reality. And to me, it's an example of our first half of the chessboard intuitions and expectations being overturned by technical reality and, and clever innovation. The Luddites were the original people who thought that technology was going to destroy jobs and destroy their livelihood. So just about 200 years ago, they spent some time smashing looms and smashing equipment in factories in Britain. And what we learned, though, was that even though that mechanization did displace some people, it created a huge amount of new opportunities and new jobs because it led to the formation of new companies, new industries, overall economic growth. So the Luddite fallacy is kind of an economist shorthand for the notion that technology destroys more jobs than it creates. Because the historical pattern is pretty clear, technology has been creating more jobs than it's been destroying. And there's a guy who wrote in the Wall Street Journal a little while back and he summarized it beautifully. He said, technology has always been creating jobs, it's always been destroying jobs. The thin difference between those two is what we call prosperity. So you bring up a great question, why do I think that balance might have shifted and that we might, we're might we heading into a world where technology is actually putting more people out of work than it's putting into work. The main reason to believe that is that when I look at the bundle of skills that a person might go offer to an employer or might go offer to the labor force, I see computers for the very first time demonstrating lots of those skills. So when I look at the Google car, it's demonstrating an ability to process massive amounts of data in real time, to do very sophisticated real-time pattern recognition. When I look at automatic translation software, I see computers that are suddenly doing a really good job at communicating. Now humans still hold out the high ground, I think, in both pattern matching and communication, but computers are eating away at that remarkably quickly and if you don't need the absolute high ground in both those areas, an employer is going to be increasingly likely to say, I'm going to prefer digital labor to, to human labor for this. Now, the bundle of skills that computers are demonstrating is growing, to my eyes, very quickly over a time. The bundle of skills that we have as people, that's kind of dictated by the pace of evolution. That's a lot slower. So I see unprecedented and, and significant digital encroachment into the stuff that people do for a living. There is a kind of bittersweet quality to the to how one concludes about this. That yeah, the society is going to be richer, yeah. but how you deal with the massive changes that it means for ordinary people is is it may very well be one of the the great political tasks of the next generation. So that may be very well the next great political task of your generation. I think it's important to understand this is not a new discussion, um, although people may have just read that Paul Krugman has just started writing about this, admitting that he probably missed this technological change moment that's coming. Martin Ford's written a book and others. Uh, but I think what's important to understand is this discussion, uh, if you read this quote, we're being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come, namely technological unemployment. This was written by John Maynard Keynes in 1930. And oddly enough, he predicted by 2030 
that this is what would happen, and he may be almost incredibly uh, on target. And I think what's important to understand is, well, people say, but, but we're creating, we, we have these great companies that are out there creating you know, all this new wealth and all this new technology. So if you look at Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, and realize we're trying to create 200,000 jobs a month to stay even to where we are in unemployment, these four companies together combined have 200,000 jobs total in the US. If you want to be generous and throw on HP, Intel, Microsoft, Dell, <laughs> on top of it, all of those companies have less employees than one company in China that produces many of their products called Foxconn. Now, people who are internationalists will say appropriately, but this is what the global economy was supposed to do. We are sort of arbitraging wages. We're providing jobs overseas that once may be in the United States. Americans may not like it, but isn't it great that China has had a 700 million persons taken out of poverty? And it is. But this is the difference between the first half of the chessboard and the second half of the chessboard. Because Foxconn just put in the largest order for robots in the history of the world. They've ordered a million robots over the next three years to replace their workforce. Because they've decided that they can no longer compete in the global economy against machines in China without the advent of technology. Um, so where do you expect jobs to come from? Now, everybody says, go get an education. This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can see uh, the chart there. You'll see that green and blue are the PhD professionals and four years degrees. Now, at least when I look at that chart, I don't see a lot of green and blue. What I see a lot of is orange and yellow, which are high school equivalent or less jobs. So as one hand, we talk about well, this is just about getting a better education and more skills, and yet the Bureau of Labor Statistics says that the jobs that require more education and skills are very limited, and that's low-wage jobs that are beginning to populate. And just to make it clear what we expect to happen right now, 24% of Americans work in low-wage jobs. That's expected to go to 48% by 2020, a tragedy you know, of huge proportions of increasing the low-wage employment in this country by 25%. And then you have to question the projections, seeing what McAfee just talked about in the second half of the chessboard. This is a, supposed to be one of the greatest increases in jobs in our country as truck drivers, 20% increase. Well, how long is it going to take before those trucks are driven by the Google robots? I mean, they're going to be more efficient. They're going to be more effective. They're going to be safer. And therefore, they will end up being cheaper. They don't have health care or any benefits, they will look like the Amazon warehouses where there are no people employed anymore. Or take a look at home health care, an industry I know a little bit about. Well, what does it mean that we now are almost able to monitor a person in their home with the same level of accuracy as we can measure their vital signs if they're down the hall in a hospital bed? And what does it mean that Japan now is experimenting with home health care robots? that actually can begin to do some of the functions that home health care aides can do much more effectively in terms of cost and availability of labor. Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. So what's the future hold? Now, I'm not arguing like some people might, and I think there may be a good discussion to have, that robots are going to take over the world. But what if technology adds 3%, 5%, 10% to the unemployment we currently have? We are going to have a human disaster in a country that was built about work and about making work pay. And so even a small growth in technological unemployment, and I think there's a much bigger opportunity to have a big growth in technological unemployment, is going to create a huge set of challenges. Now, people again say, well, let's just solve this problem by education. And I want to say a lot of this is well-intentioned. It's completely pablum. It has no data-driven, factual basis to it. But it just sounds good. Ask any politician, what are we going to do about this? Everybody's going to, workers of the world get smart. Uh, 
The truth is real wage earnings for college BA degree graduates is declining, as you can see. Real earnings for college graduates are down since 2000. And what's actually really getting to be upsetting, particularly for low wage workers, is as college graduates can't find jobs that they're qualified for, they're beginning to take the jobs of what used to go to high school people. So all of a sudden, 48% of college graduates are underemployed. And so yes, there may be a wage gap between low wage workers and college graduates, and it's holding flat, but college graduates' wages, wages are going down, and the gap is only because we're pushing down even further people into unemployment and otherwise. Now, other people say it's innovation. If we can only innovate more in America, another amount of important consideration, we should innovate more. We always should innovate more. I'm all for innovation. But if Apple Computer with $173 billion in the bank, the largest market cap in the history of the world, only has 43,000 employees. That's an issue in and of itself. Each of those employees generate $3 million of sales a year. And we know Apple's margins are really high. This is not like grocery sales. These are huge, high margin sales. These are kids, if you go to the Genius Bar, most of them have college, if not a college degree, a lot of college education. And until the complaint in the New York Times made a big deal of it, they were making $11.94 an hour. Please don't give me any more innovation you know, as the answer to this problem in the economy. So what do we do? This is probably a much longer discussion. It is the discussion of our time. There is not going to be enough jobs for people in America. We will get economic growth. We will get productivity growth. We don't anymore mean we get job growth. And certainly, we now know we don't get wage growth. And this is what Carl says. We need a no social contract. It is, not about, it is about our nation and its values and its future. And I always like to say, the future is not a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. But if we're solving the wrong problem, we will make the wrong choices. Thanks. Let me, uh...